today's speaker. It's my pleasure to uh, do this. Um, Rick and I have been friends and colleagues for a long time because uh, we both uh, went to Oregon State at the same time. So to give you a little update on what his past is, um, 1976, uh, finished his uh, BS in, at the University of Massachusetts. Um, in the early 80s, mid to 80s, he was at OSU getting his master's degree, um, which overlapped my PhD work uh, at Oregon State. So we both, that's where we first got to know each other. Um, and don't ask him about all the things we did <laughs> while we were there, because yeah. there's lots of Later. stories. <laughs> um, and then he went on to the University of Washington, got his PhD in 1990. Um, and he's currently the fish, uh, fisheries, a research fisheries biologist with Natural Marine Fisheries Service, um, stationed in Newport, Oregon, um, and also has a position with Oregon State as an associate um, adjunct, associate professor. So I thought I'd just, um, I just, I was just reading through his CV beforehand, and I, um, he's got about 145 published papers at this point, and um, I just read off, or just uh, started noting the kind of the head word that sort of implied what he was doing. And just to show you the breadth of stuff that he's done. I'm just, there's just one word or, um, just to go through that. So ichthyoplankton, brachyurin, mega, me, megalope, salmon, Humboldt squid, anchovy, euphausids, jellyfish, predator, prey, fatty acids, lipids, soury, lidar, mctophids, hake, food webs, sardines, pollock, zooplankton, climate change, Pacific Ocean perch, ketognas, cutthroat trout, rockfish, and shrimp. So. <laughs> That's the breadth of stuff that he's done um, over his course of his, his work. And I, I kind of, if you have to classify Rick, I guess I would classify him as a fisheries oceanographer, um, sort of out of the mold of Bill Piercy, if you've ever known Bill. Bill was a very famous, at least uh, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> very famous uh, fisheries biologist, oceanographer at Oregon State. Um, and he was on my committee. He was on Rick's committee. R really great guy. Anyway, I, I sort of view Rick a lot. Um, uh, similar to Bill Piercy and his, his interests and his, um, his productivity. So anyway, it's great to have Rick here. He's going to be talking about some work he's been doing um, with jellyfish and uh, marine fishes. And uh, we've had him here to some extent because uh, Allison and Scott um, Benson and I have been talking to him about putting a proposal into NSF to do some work on jellyfish here in the California Current. So Rick. All right. Thank you, Jim. You. Thanks. Thanks for coming. And, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and, and present some of the work we've been doing in the last few years on jellyfish. And probably a lot of you may recognize this species. This is taken right out here in Monterey Bay. And they're a big problem around the world. And I hope to kind of fill you in on some of the problems that have been going on in the jellyfish world in the last few years. But uh, um, I do have to start off with some disclaimers. And uh, you know, you're not supposed to do that. But uh, the first one is I am definitely not a jellyfish expert. In fact, I've had zero training in jellyfish. I, I'm a fish biologist, as Jim had mentioned, and even though I've done all those different things, I'm, I'm not an expert and really certainly not in jellyfish, and I, I just kind of dabble in them, but they, I, they're very fascinating animals, and I'm, I feel like I'm learning something about it, but there's a lot I don't know about them, so hopefully I'll be, if there's questions, I can answer them. But even the, more importantly, at one time, I didn't even like jellyfish. I mean, I thought, you know, being a fishery biologist, I'd be pulling up these trawls filled with these slimy, stingy animals, and I just really had a strong dislike for them for many years. And then sort of once I started studying them and looking at them, I kind of, at least if not a, a uh, uh, how would I say it, I probably, if not as much of a distaste, that, you know, at least I tolerate them and actually find them to be quite fascinating animals, and I hope to at least convey some of that to you. But, uh, you know, I, obviously sometimes you have to study things that you don't like, but I've actually kind of at least can tolerate them now anyway. So hopefully they're kind of interesting animals. So what do I mean by jellyfish? That's sort of a generic term, obviously, and it includes a bunch of different um, groups of animals, some of which are totally unrelated. There are different phyla. That, um, and these animals that have adopted a gelatinous existence, they are mostly water, they're mostly transparent, um, very, uh, you know, require very little in terms of energy to make to grow, basically, compared to some of the, the, the harder bodied animals. But they, because, but I guess because it is such a, a adaptive um, trait that many different groups have, have uh, developed it. So you have what we consider the Scypha medusae, which are common, you know, or bell medusae, which kind of like the one in the upper right hand corner there. Um, but you have other groups like the Cuba, Cuba medusae, Hydra medusae, which uh, like this one that tend to be much smaller. Um, and then you, you've got other things like siphonophores and, and then others, uh, different phyla, the comb jellies. So there are actually quite a few different groups that have, as I said, 
uh, adopted this. So we kind of think of jellyfish as uh, you know all these different uh, types of animals, but they all have different life histories. And one of the things you're probably familiar with, at least for the a lot of the the, the Skypha medusae actually have what's called the metagenic life cycle. So they actually go through different phases where they have a, a pelagic phase that is your typical medusae that you're familiar with, and there are male and female representatives there. They they um, you know they cross fertilize and they produce larvae that um, and this mainly happens in the late summer fall, um, and then these larvae settle down to the bottom and they produce polyps that are actually attached to the bottom, they have to be attached to the bottom, and then they can overwinter that way. And in the spring, they uh, bud asexually, so they're all clones of each other. They bud off all these little individual, um, what they call a phyra, that become eventually adults. Um, so these can complete this all in one year. So they actually have a very quick life cycle, and they can, and, which makes them very adaptable to changing conditions. So why are we interested in jellyfish? Well, in, in recent years, you've probably heard a lot about some major increases of jellyfish populations um, all over the world. And, and so there's been a lot of you know, curiosity of why this is happening and what, what are the causes of these outbreaks. And you know, there's been some theories that some of these blooms can be just natural occurrences that have always happened. But then it, we think that a lot of them may be the result of human activities, sort of uh, things like uh, pollution, uh, eutrophication, uh, species introductions, a lot of different things, overfishing. Um, may be contributing to that. And I'll kind of go over some of those theories and talk about it. Um, there's been a lot of papers that have been talking about this rise of the slime hypothesis that um, was kind of brought up first in this paper here that attributes this increase in jellyfish to um, overfishing in a lot of ecosystems. And you know, they say if we're fishing down all the fish, all we're gonna have left is jellyfish, basically. And you know, maybe there is some truth to that, but there's been sort of so much in the media and some of the scientific literature that you know these jellyfish are like taking over the world or the oceans, and you know may, maybe that's true, but we, you know we haven't seen it yet. But I'll kind of give you some evidence in some places where it may may be happening. But there was a very big paper that came out in um, Trends in Ecology and Evolution a few years back called the Jellyfish Joyride, which kind of was trying to put this all together and, and figure out well what's happening in terms of the jellyfish in the world. And these these authors came up with a number of different. Uh, possible causes of jellyfish blooms around the world, and many of them, or probably most of them, are related to human activity. So you have things like eutrophication, where you have lots of agriculture that produces um, nutrients in excess that get run off into coastal waters. So you get these huge algal blooms, and that um, it, some of that favors um, jellyfish production. And you also get sinking of these jelly, uh, these uh, I'm sorry, algal blooms down to the bottom, and then you get decomposition. So you get actually hypoxic conditions in low. Uh, in the bottom that sometimes spread all the way up to the surface. And that, it turns out that jellyfish actually can tr and tolerate very low oxygen compared to most vertebrates and even other crustaceans and things. So they do perfectly well in hypoxic conditions and they may even be at a competitive advantage. So that's one way that they're increasing. Climate change is another uh, theory that they're uh, the warmer waters, the jellyfish are growing faster. There may be more food in some systems. And also, um, they may be different types of food that may favor jellyfish over other things like uh, fin fish or even uh, euphosids and krill and things like that. So that's another thing. There are some others that may be more direct, um, you know, ballast water translocation. And I'll give some examples. There have been a number of those where there have been introductions of, of jellyfish into areas where they never occurred and they have no natural predators, so they've had to take it over. So that's one, one issue. But also, um, creating more habitat for that bottom polyp stage is, is, is a big issue in many countries as we're, we're developing more and more of our coastline with breakwaters and wharfs and other aquaculture pens that these are all potential habitat for these polyps that wasn't available before. So that may be another way that they're increasing. And then of course, a lot of people tend to point at overfishing that we're knocking down the fish and these jellyfish are kind of take, filling the niche that the, the fish have vacated and stuff. And also that the, you know, uh, um, pulling up a lot of the potential predators on the polyp stages in the benthic environment. So there's a lot of different ways that humans can interact with jellyfish, and, and most of them tend to favor jellyfish. So I guess just to kind of look at what are, are jellyfish actually increasing globally, there have been a couple studies that have attempted to address it, but one of the things I wanted to point out, this review paper that Jennifer Pipsell did a few years back where she looked at um, sort of the in the number of years per decade where they talked about where there were reports of either effects of jellyfish on fisheries or stinging at beaches where they closed beaches uh, to bathing because of uh, stinging or that they actually went into power plants and closed power plants in different parts of the world. 
And this kind of gives a timeline, and you can see that there was, you know, not many reports, at least back in, you know, up till 1950 for, for none for stinging of power stations. And of course, so, you know, of course they're, they're increasing dramatically. And look at the last, the most recent decade, had almost every year had a report of all three of those things. So it's things seem to be on the rise, or at least they're being reported more than they were in the past. There have been some studies that have looked at the data uh, in terms of whether there have been increases in jellyfish abundance. And this was a, a study by a group, uh, Lucas Bratz and others from University of British Columbia, where they looked at the, what are called these large marine ecosystems around the world, wherever they, um, and these are areas that have very tend to have very similar uh, fisheries and, and um, sort of ecosystems. So they classify, well, other people have classified these LMEs, and they looked at the jellyfish populations within all these, and they classified based on the, all the available data whether they were increasing at a high certainty, so for sure they look like they're increasing, a low, well, it's uncertain, but they appear to be increasing, stable or decreasing. And you can see the percentages. Most of the ecosystems in the world were either increasing with a high or, or at least low uh, certainty. And there are only three that were showing a decrease. Um, so it, it appears that, at least looking at it on this broad scale, that jellyfish are increasing in, in the, around the world. And then they, they looked at, a, in, in a follow-up paper, they've been looking at the sort of what factors are related to that, so they were able to get data on these, all these different um, drivers, such as fishing and uh, eutrophication and things like that. And pretty much all of them were significant in terms of uh, with the trends. So there's a lot of factors maybe either interacting or it seems like none of them, it's really hard to rule out almost any of these um, factors. So they're all intertwined. And then there's another study that uh, I, I was involved, there was an NC's working group on jellyfish uh, that we actually were putting together data from around, uh, databases from around the world, everything we could find on jellyfish. And there actually came up with a, over, over half a million um, collections of jellyfish around the world or, or collections that would have had jellyfish had been there. And what they did was look at sort of geographically the distribution of them. So this is kind of gives you an idea of the geographic spread. Every one of these dots had, had some data from it. But some areas, which are shown by the bigger circles, actually had a lot more data. They had uh, multiple years. So um, what they did was take a look at certain years that had at least 10 or 15 years worth of data. And these are kind of time series going back from to the first ones were around 1940 to the present. And you can see the different time series, and, and don't worry about where the locations are, but these kind of give you a, a, an indication up here. And you can see they're pretty heavily concentrated in the Northern Hemisphere, where a lot of the marine science work's been done. There's only a few of them from the Southern Hemisphere and one from Antarctica, but so it's, it's pretty much uh, biased by Northern Hemisphere, but that's where the data are, I guess. So anyway, what they, what they were doing is looking at the trends, and the color indicates, and the reds are increasing trend, Black are no trend, and then blue are decreasing trends. So you can also see them here up on the on the plot. Um, but uh, so this gives you an idea of the data. And and then if you looked at the slopes of all these, it turns out that if you looked at the entire time period from 1940 to 2010, there really wasn't any difference. Uh, there, there was a, perhaps a few more positive slopes, um, uh, but there were a bunch of negatives, and it didn't seem to be really much of a pattern. Really, there was no significant difference in the slopes between. Uh, throughout this time period. But if you looked at the more recent uh, years, from 1970 to 2011, there were a lot more positive slopes than negative slopes. So what, they, what we did was put this data all together in sort of a time series. And you can see that in this plot here. And this is showing by abundance. And this is the bottom one is uh, presence absence, basically, where they're jellyfish or not, um, in, irregardless of how many there were. But just focusing on the top one here, this gives, gives the time trend. So basically, all those time series together uh, melded together, and you can see sort of the red is sort of the five-year annual mean here. But you can see that the, um, there's a lot of variability, and there actually seems to be some um, trends going, or some uh, periodicity in here. Every few years, there tends to be more jellyfish blooms throughout the world than other years. But again, if you look at sort of just the last, since 1970, there, it does seem to be an upward trend, even despite that um, little bump down here and maybe another one more recently, the trend is definitely higher. And it, you could say, well, yeah, of course, you're starting at the bottom, you would get a trend up to the top, you know. But, but the reason for that is if you look at the number of observations, as you can see in that last plot, there really wasn't much, you know, there's probably maybe four to six observations that made up these, where they're here, we're getting to about 20 or 30 time series. Um, so it's, the data are definitely better since 1970, but that is, you know, one thing you could think about. So I guess if you were to draw conclusions, it doesn't, you know, there, are, there does seem to be more jellyfish, um, 
blooms out there, but it's not sufficient to say that it's happening everywhere. Some places seem to be decreasing, but there does seem to be an overall trend upward. And then they do rise and fall over multi-decadal scales. So, you know, if you're, depending on what time or when you are there, you might see a very high or low period. So you need to have really long time series to look at that. And really, I think over the next 20 years or so, we should be able to resolve this question. Hopefully, if they, if they continue to rise, I think it, it's pretty apparent. But we may be in a downward cycle for a while. So it's, it's kind of important to keep monitoring out there. So now, like, what I'd like to do is talk about various systems around the world. And this is one where I originally started working on jellyfish up in the Bering Sea. So this is, here's a map of the eastern Bering Sea, so Alaska. This is the Aleutian Islands down here. Um, and, and the nice thing about the Bering Sea is that the, the National Marine Fisheries Service has been running a survey there every year, well, starting in 1975, and then every year since 1979 onward, where they do the exact same methods. They sample about 360 stations the exact same time of year, same methodology, everything. Just, and they're actually surveying, obviously, for fish. But they did, throughout the survey, collect all the information on jelly. So any time a jelly would come up, they'd get weights of them and you know, numbers and things like that. So they, it actually turns out to be an interesting time series because it is one of the longest around in the, in the world. Um, so what, what I started doing was, when I started working on these, I, you know, this is what the data looked like until 1990. There didn't seem to be much of a trend. And I want to point out that the black here is the, sort of this whole survey area. And then it, I'm breaking it out by the middle shelf, or southeast middle shelf, which is right here, where they most tend to be. Uh, and then this is the northwest middle shelf here. Which, so they tend to be in the middle shelf region of the Bering Sea. So you can keep an eye on where, how those trends go. But from 1975 to 90, really, there wasn't much of a pattern at all. But look what happened after that. It just really took off um, in, the, in the 1990s. And, and this was not just shown in the survey. It was showing up everywhere. I mean, the fishermen started complaining because they said that people had been out there for 30 years. They'd never seen jellyfish like this out here. So it seems like this is sort of you know, validates or at least corroborates the story a little bit. But they just took off. And you know, by 2000, they were just like totally off the scale here. It's just, uh, it was amazing how many jellies were out there. And this kind of shows the distribution. Again, mostly in the middle shelf region, but in the high years, they were even getting way up here into, into Bristol Bay. So they were just about everywhere there. Well, this is just an index, yes. Um, and it's probably not, uh, uh, I wouldn't say that was the total biomass. It's just an index because these are bottom trawls, so they're not probably catching them. So I think the internet annual pattern is, is valid and probably the spatial pattern. And I could talk to you more about that. that we, we, we acknowledge that it's not an absolute abundance and shouldn't be used as one. But that's what we got in the survey in terms of the catch per unit effort. So. OK, so then we published a paper saying, wow, look at this big uh, bloom going on there. And then right after we published it, that's what happened. <laughs> as, as always, it drops off again. So we actually had to write another paper that was called The Rise and Fall of Jellyfish in the Eastern Bering Sea and said, OK, we're trying to figure out what's going on here. You know, What happened? Hey, where did these guys go? And, um, and there's actually a whole story to that. I probably don't have time to talk about it, but we are looking at the, the, the sort of the environmental correlates to this. But after, right after we came out with that paper, they went back up again. So, you know, it's like, you know, we're having a pattern here, it seems, that they're going up and down, up and down. And, you know, maybe as we continue to get more years, we'll see this uh, happening. And, and one of the things I just pointed up here, since, 19, uh, since 2006, they started getting the species composition. We, after asking them, and said, well, what you got you to find out what the species are. So they actually, we sent them out little identification guides. So they actually have been able to, and it turns out it's pretty easy because they're all one species almost. It's the black here is all Chrysiora melanaster, which is a, a congener of the species we have here, but it's a different one that uh, doesn't occur off the coast here. And it's pretty much a complete, you know, almost, an, uh, I would say, a monoculture of Chrysiora melanaster up there. It's amazing how many there are. Really interesting. So that's one story. Um, another area that's also an interesting story, this is uh, the Benguela Current. So this is off of South Africa, Namibia here. So the northern part of the Benguela Current off the coast of Namibia has been very interesting. They used to have incredibly high um, big pelagic fisheries for things like anchovies, sardines, things like that. Really, and it was mostly not lo local fishermen. It was high, distant water fleets from Europe and other places that came and really fished it pretty hard. So See, this is the, the fisheries catch here. And in the old days, they had very few reports of jellyfish. It was almost pure fish catch, either sardines, anchovies, whatever they were going for. And then all of a sudden, as often happens in many places, there was a big collapse of the fishery, and probably through overfishing, but it could be climate or whatever, but we think it's overfishing. And they'd really dropped down to a, a very low level. 
And what happens was that they started getting reports of jellyfish coming in. And the fishermen going, well, we've never seen these before. Where are they, where are they coming from? And now almost all the catches are jellyfish. And you go out and do either surveys or commercial fishermen try to go catch. It's almost all jellies. And there's an example of one of the surveys that went out recently. Just you know, probably 99.9% .9 of the catch was jellyfish, which you would have never seen in the old days. So there was a paper that came out in 2006. Chris Lyman and his group that you know, published in Current Biology and it actually you know, documented that now there are way more jellies than fish out there. And they did this both acoustically and by trawl. And they, and they said that just that the system has just completely shifted. And then there's a more recent paper that John Paul Rue and others uh, published where they came up with a new uh, name, Jellification of the Benguela Current. And what they showed with this little uh, schematic is this is what the system and then to sardines and to predators, either um, fish predators or seabirds or marine mammals or whatever. Um, and so this is kind of a normal upwelling ecosystem that you have. But after the collapse, there was almost no sardines. All the phytoplankton, all the zooplankton went into jellyfish pretty much. And then it turns out that there is a fish that feeds on jellyfish, this goby, which is kind of a deep water fish of total, you know, they don't get very big, so there's no human uh, use apparently. They're not edible. So pretty much now, what used to all go into uh, fish that could either be collected by humans or by birds and mammals now goes into this goby and it pretty much is sort of a dead end in the ecosystem. So this system has just completely collapsed, basically, in terms of the fishery. And you know who knows if it's ever going to get back to the original. I mean, there's a lot more stuff now going into the bottom, so maybe they'll have more demersal fish or crabs or whatever. But the pelagic fishery is pretty much all gone. It's all everything in the pelagic zone is jellyfish. So it's another kind of a sad story there. This is another area in the Black Sea where actually um, it was, um, this is what the fisheries used to look like um, back in the 80s till about 1990. And then all of a sudden there was an introduction of a species. This is a tenophore, Nemeopsis, that was actually introduced from, it's, it, it's uh, native to the east coast of the United States, but it got introduced through ballast water into the Black Sea. And of course there it had no natural predators so it just took off and you know there could have been the collapse could have been from overfishing but they think that uh, this uh, species had a lot to do with it because it turns out that this species eats a lot of fish eggs and larvae and maybe uh, actually out competing the fish once it gets settled uh, and they got just incredible densities of nemeopsis in the in the baltic sea totally changed the system and since that time the, the fisheries have been almost non-existent they've been really at a low level um, this chart shows the um, do ichthyoplankton survey, so looking at fish larvae, and, and back in the sampling, back in the 60s, they got tons of fish larvae. And then all this period when Nemeopsis was in there, very few fish larvae. And the interesting thing was, in more recent years, they've come back. And the reason is, another introduction of a, a, a different jellyfish, which actually preys on this jellyfish. So we have sort of a top-down control on this jellyfish that was getting out. And that may actually be bringing the system back to more normal, well, probably never be normal because there'll still be these alien species in there, but at least in terms of the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, how the functioning of the system might be more what it used to be. So here's an example where you know, jellyfish can you know, be introduced, but then a predator could be introduced to, uh, to actually control that jellyfish population. But this Nemeopsis is kind of interesting because as I mentioned, they started down in the Black Sea here um, and they came into, um, they, they started showing up in the Aegean Sea near Greece. So they were there, and then they started moving into the Western Mediterranean. And then they were, somebody found them in 2005. They were recorded up off of Norway. Nobody knows how they probably came up in ballast water up there. So the first observation up there. And then they were found in this area and then farther into the Baltic, um, into the North Sea, off the coast of Norway, way up into the Baltic. So they're pretty much in through, and in fact, I was just in a meeting in Spain, and now they've discovered them here in the Bay of Biscay. So they're pretty much in all European waters. So this species is probably going to be here permanently in Europe, which they never had this before. And there's a lot of concern about this because they find that they're, this is an example from the Baltic Sea where they found um, cod eggs inside. These little round things here are actual cod eggs that were, so the species preys a lot on fish eggs. And, and the cod population is very important in the Baltic and the North Sea. So they are really worried about this. And there's a lot of effort going into trying to control this um, alien population that seems to be spreading all over the place. And there are actually some examples of where they think that jellyfish may be affecting um, survival. And this is an example, from, again, from Chris Lyman, uh, where he looked at um, herring recruitment. So, the, and then, so that's the, uh, the black line here. 
um, interannual variation in that. And then they compared that to jellyfish abundance from uh, surveys, in this case, Aurelia. And you see a very strong inverse correlation, highly, highly negatively correlated. So when you have a lot of jellyfish, you get very poor recruitment of, of herring. So there, there could be some, something going on here. It's hard to say, but it certainly looks uh, suggestive of uh, a top-down effect on herring eggs and, or larvae, I should say. And then another big thing that's happening in Europe is they do a lot of salmon farming, and um, especially in uh, North Scotland, um, Northern Ireland, and in uh, Norway. And they've had this incredible tax or things where they've had to uh, completely uh, get rid of all the fish in there. And salmon, um, mostly salmon, I guess, is where they're you know killing off millions of fish basically by these. Uh, and what happens is they get inside the pens and they cause all these lesions on fish and they basically have to, and they suffocate the fish. And so that's getting to be a really big uh, issue there that they're really worried about because they have a, it's a very huge industry up there that they produce all these Atlantic salmon and they're losing you know, millions of dollars a year because of jellyfish. So another, another way that they affect the ecosystem. But the really, one of the really big examples is you probably may have heard about this one. This is a, a jellyfish called, uh, they're called the giant jellyfish, Nemopolina. Um, from Japan, and they are huge. I mean, you can see the size. They're six feet across. I mean, it's one of the bigger jellyfish in the world, um, and they can weigh up to 450 pounds for one individual. So they're, they're monsters, and uh, as you can imagine, they're just incredible. I mean, you can't miss these guys when they're out there. And there actually have been some reports in the past where they came about every 30 or 40 years, they'd show up off the coast of Japan. So you can see these years where these giant jellyfish do show up there. But looking more recently, they're just about there almost every year now, um, which never happened before. And um, we have some more data since then. They've showed up a couple times, not quite this with this frequency, but they are. They seem to be there almost at least several times a decade now. So this definitely seems to be an increase in the uh, occurrence of these guys. And I mean, they're just incredible densities there uh, of these jellyfish. And one of the scientists estimated that they can consume about a quarter of the biomass each day of plankton out there, so that. You know, you can imagine that the, these poor fish that are out there probably have no food left because these jellies are eating everything out there. So it's really a big issue. And of course, the Japanese are much more dependent than probably anybody in terms of getting their food from the ocean. So they have an incredibly huge fishing industry, and they're having a big impact of these giant jellyfish that are showing up in the nets. There's actually boats, uh, trawl boats that have capsized because they had so many jellies in the net and stuff. So pretty big issue there, you know. Tons of complaints about damage to nets and you know having to throw the whole catch away because it was just all jellies, and it, you know there's an estimate here for just one year alone about 350 million dollars uh, uh, was lost to the fishing industry directly because of not including the indirect effects of you know all the food they consume that the fish might consume. So it's a pretty big impact and certainly something to keep in, uh, that the Japanese are very worried about. And uh, this uh, colleague of mine, uh, Shinichi Yushe, has come up with his little um, jellyfish spiral thing that showing that this is probably what they used to be like, a very fish-dominated system. And then because of all these different uh, effects of humans uh, or otherwise, they're sort of going into the spiral where the, jelly, the medusae are preying on fish eggs and larvae. And, and once you get to this kind of system, it's very hard to get back to this. It's really, without going in there and manipulating somehow, it's probably naturally not going to go back to this kind of a system. So it just, it's going to have some major issues for the long term for the Japanese. And hope, you know, they're kind of working on things to prevent this from happening or to you know, maybe at least uh, minimize the impacts. But it's, not, it's probably going to be something around for many years. So now I'm going to talk a little bit closer to home and some of the interests that I've had in the California current. So I work in the Northern California current off of Oregon and Washington, and, and we have a jellyfish problem there too, although it's, it's not quite to the same scale the Japanese have. But, um, and one of the things you see is we do surveys like from April through September, and you, you see a real increase in the biomass of, of jellies, or actually number, but also biomass. Um, you have very few there in the spring, and possibly because they go through the mesh of our nets, but by the summer, they're pretty much everywhere. We, we often get catches like this of almost pure jellyfish. Um, and this is an example of some surveys that we did from, so here's northern Washington, there's the Columbia River, and basically the California border is right here. So we go a little bit into northern California. And this shows our sampling grid, and you can see the, the density is related to the size of the circle. So this is Chrysiora, the sea nettle, in the springtime, and these are all the forage fish combined. So you can see the blue dots are the highest concentration. So there's more forage fish than there are jellies in the early part of the year. But by the end of the summer, it's the other way around, a lot more jellies than forage fish. And, and, but there, you can see the overlap is pretty substantial. They're found in a lot of the, the same areas. 
And here's an example of a catch just during one survey where we got you know, almost 18,000 jellies. We got about 9,000 or almost 10,000 fish of these pelagic species and then all the others. So the jelly, there were about almost twice as many jellies as there were fish out in the ecosystem, which probably may not be the, the normal situation. We don't know, but it certainly is not what we expected. So what we're trying to do is look at ways that we might predict jellyfish abundance. And we've been working on some, um, looking at environmental factors. And this is very crude based on just a few years of data. But we find that just looking at the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is a large scale atmospheric, it sort of measures the variation in temperature in the North Pacific. Um, and the Columbia River flow, um, which is negatively related, you see that there is a, we can account for about 90 3% of the variability in the Medusa interannual variation in Medusa abundance. So we're hoping to kind of follow this up and look in a little bit more detail. But it, if that's the case, we can get a pretty good predictor because these numbers are available before we even go out sampling or early in the year. So we can, we can get a good idea whether it's going to be a, strong, a good or bad jellyfish year based on just monitoring the environmental variables. So it's one of the things we're kind of following up on. But my real interest, because I work for National Fisheries, is I'm supposed to be working on fish. So I got to tie fish in somehow to this story. So even though I like jellies, uh, they're, uh, now they're, they're, they're probably, it's hard to get funding for jellyfish. So I'm kind of going at the angle that jellyfish can affect fish. And you've seen some examples. So what, I like to, what I've been doing is trying to look at how jellyfish affect some of the dominant pelagic species that we have. And some of these are familiar herring, sardine, anchovy, and smelt are, are really what they call the big forage off our coast. Um, but we have others like jack mackerel, sorry, a little bit farther offshore. And of course, being up in the Northwest, salmon are very important. The juveniles go out into the ocean and they're, you know, that's a very critical time. And I'll show you some data about those. But so these are the fish that we catch the most in our surveys. And what we want to do is how do, how do jellies affect these fishers? So what we did was look at the diets of a number of these different species. And um, um, we looked at, uh, so here are the two jellyfish, the dominant one, the uh, sea nettle and the moon jelly here in the middle, the big circles. And you can see their diet composition. And then around them are all those species of fish. And you can see some fish, like the salmon, don't seem to have much of an overlap at all. They salmon eat are mostly larger fish or, or bigger items that the jellies don't eat. Um, but you do see there's four species that seem to have a fairly good overlap here, mainly because of the occurrence of your eggs in early life stages. And these are the ones that are kind of the most interesting to us. And you can actually calculate sort of a diet overlap uh, percent similarity between these. And you know, they consider 60% somewhat over, uh, significant overlap. And you can see that these are the four species that really do have a similar diet to these jellyfish. Again, the salmon are way off, but, um, but the, uh, these guys are really the ones that are the most uh, similar in terms of diet. And then we also have some evidence looking at stable isotopes. And for those that aren't familiar with it, there, there are two things you measure, the Del uh, C13 and the Del N15. And to kind of go uh, give you, uh, this kind of measures the distance offshore. So along this scale, offshore would be here, inshore would be here. Um, so you can get it by looking at the Del C13, you can look at the, um, the distance that these animals probably were feeding at. And then the, looking at the other, oops, I'm sorry, the other axis, uh, the nitrogen, that gives you approximate trophic level, going from low trophic level here to higher trophic level. And I didn't mark this as actually sharks, so they're the, basically the top trophic level in our area. And these are um, euphosids and copepods down here. So there, you can see there's like about every three steps up in carbon or nitrogen is one trophic level. So one of the things you can see, Chrysiorid aurelia here, the two species are, uh, and if you looked at this would be, everything within this box is basically the same trophic level. So you can see the species that have very similar um, nitrogen composition, anchovies, herring, sardines, and sorry, the same four that I saw. So this is giving sort of totally independent away from the, you know, looking at their stomach contents. It's telling us the same thing, that these guys are feeding pretty much on the same trophic level, at least, and probably many of the same prey items. So what we do is we actually, I'm working with a guy, Jim Ruzica, who's a, um, um, a modeler. So we do these things called, you probably heard about echopath models, these giant, you know, sort of like simulations of the ecosystem out there. And you have all these different boxes and you have energy flow from one box mainly from the lower trophic level up to the highest. And so you get pinnipeds and other things at the top, and then you get phytoplankton and detritus at the bottom. In, the, in, the, in, this, in these uh, examples, this is one that we're looking at, for instance, krill, which is right here, this red box. And what we do is we show in green is all the flow into krill. So from, you know, where does the, how do, where do krill get their energy from? So mostly below them and something sort of at the same trophic level as them. 
And then the red boxes is the flow out of krill. So where do krill end up? And you can see there's lots of things that eat krill, which is what you'd expect. They're very, they're very important. And you can actually come up with metrics of these connectivities within here. So all the, all the green, if you sort of add those all up, you can come up with a, a number, and we call that the footprint. So that's basically what the bottom or top-down effect of krill is on the lower trophic levels. And you can come up with a number that you can quantify that. And the other one is the reach, where they, how do they go up to the upper trophic levels? And there's the number there. And you can see for krill, it's not bad. It's about what, four times or whatever, three times as high. Um, so that's a pretty good turnover rate. So for all the energy that krill eat, most of that gets passed up to higher trophic levels. So that, that's pretty good. You can contrast that with jellyfish, which are right here. And you can see lots of green. So they do have a very big bottom or top down effect, almost no uh, red going up from them. Uh, there are a few species that feed on them, but not, not a major part of their diet. And you can come up with those tro uh, footprint versus reach numbers, and that's like whatever, 400 times. So quite different than the krill. So this is telling us that relatively little of the energy going into, into jellyfish gets passed up to the higher trophic levels. And then so what you can do is we look at an interannual variability, uh, uh, variation here. So we have surveys from a number of different years. Here's krill, and then I've got forage fish here, another, another important group, and then jellyfish. And you can see the relative amount, uh, you know, the krill get passed up pretty well from year to year. Um, the forage fish, not bad, and you can see some, but, you know, it's about 10 to 1, which is sort of a typical of trophic. And look at the jellyfish. I mean, there is some red up there, but you can barely see it. It's really, like, uh, totally, um, they, almost all their impact is down. They send very little energy up to the, so it is sort of like a trophic dead end. And this is an estimate of the food consumption from um, in the springtime. As I said, there are a lot more forage fish out there. So forage fish are consuming most of the energy on the shelf based on our modeling exercises during from April to June. Um, but by the end of the summer, forage fish go, or actually go down and the, the jellyfish take over as the biggest consumer on the shelf. And, and that's really important. Um, you can see all the, how little other groups like mammals, seabirds and stuff, they basically don't even show up compared to the, the forage fish. And, and the jellyfish. So again, another way to quantify that. And then the other thing you can do with these models, because they're connected, you can do scenarios where you can run thousands of models and just tweak um, one thing. And in this case, there's an example where we increase jellyfish by just one standard deviation above the long-term mean, which is well within the interannual uh, uh, levels of variability. And this is what happens to all the other trophic levels. You can see every one of them decreases from the uh, basic, except for small copepods, every one of them decreases from the, the baseline. Um, and, and you can see the variability here. A um, couple things of interest. These are the forage fish, so anchovies and sardines. They do decrease, but they're not the major, um, the impact's not the greatest on them. It actually turns out that salmon are very heavily impacted by, by these models. And what happens is, as I mentioned, they're not feeding on the exact same thing that the forage, uh, the, the jellyfish are eating on, but the jellyfish are, are impacting the, the, the small fish and things that these um, salmon are feeding on. So it's sort of a secondary impact. And it turns out that there can be, you know, these, based on these simulations, uh, just uh, increasing that can tend to be just a, an 18% overall decrease in the amount of salmon during high jellyfish years. So, I mean, that, this has a big impact, you know, monetarily as well as uh, ecologically. And so we do, so what we did is we wanted to look at the sort of, the, is there any evidence that jellyfish are affecting uh, feeding of, of salmon? And here are three different salmon coho yearlings, sub yearlings, and these are two different types. They go out at different times of the year, but, um, or different years of their life. But basically think of these as three different uh, species almost. Um, and you look at, what we did was look at their feeding intensity, how much food do they had in their stomach versus the, the uh, jellyfish biomass in quartiles that we catch in the trawls with them. And you could see that when they're the lowest quartiles, so the stations that had the fewest jellyfish, they were feeding a lot more, or they had a lot more food in their stomachs, I should say, than the, any of the other, uh, you know, either over 25%, their food consumption drops greatly. So that's a suggestive, at least, that there might be some kind of a, a negative uh, impact of, or competition going on between the jellies and the salmon, or some kind of negative impact anyway. And how does this end up in terms of recruitment? Well, it's interesting because we plotted here the adult returns for these different, these three groups. So sometimes they recur either one year later than we catch them or three years later. So what we did was plot the adult returns in this, on this axis versus the number of jellies when, they, when these salmon first went out to the ocean. So we had to lag them back for either one or three years. And you see a very strong negative relationship. There does seem to be an inverse 
um, they're all significant. So there, there may be some kind of an inverse relationship going on. When you have a lot of jellies out there in the system, you get, tend to get very poor salmon um, survival. So what I'd like to do is end up here on a talk about a project I'm involved in now. Um, it's called, uh, it's part of the Lenfest Ocean uh, Program. It's funded by the Pew Charitable Trust and they, uh, they were interested in looking at what's going on in ecosystems around the world and are these jellies affecting fish and other parts of the ecosystem. So they actually got some funding on a number of collaborators here that were working on this project. And we're actually looking at five different ecosystems around the world. So we got the Bering Sea, the area I've been talking about, the Northern California Current, the Gulf of Mexico, and then Peru, and then off the Sea of Japan. So looking at very different ecosystems. And what we're trying to do is get at this question, is there, are jellyfish really a shunt for the production, the zooplankton production, if it ends up by going into jellies, does that mean less production going into forage fish, which of course do end up by feeding a lot of these upper trophic levels, whereas jellyfish really, not much of it gets transferred up there. And also, is there a top-down effect of jellyfish on fish eggs and larvae. So it's kind of a big order. and we've, we've been into the funding for about a year now, and I'll give some examples of some of the results that we've got so far. Um, but I wanted to talk about sort of the general objective. So we want to quantify the role of jellyfish and forage fish in these ecosystems and look at, you know, do the different scenarios under different fishing and climate conditions to see how that affects either the jellyfish and the forage fish. And then we want to look at sort of that spatial and temporal overlap between jellyfish and forage fish. And, but what we're hoping to do is actually have some kind of tool that we can use to give managers a, you know, an idea of what, what is a, a, a healthy ecosystem versus one that may be dominated by jellyfish. So that's our ultimate goal. We haven't got there yet, but we're working on that. But just to kind of give these examples, and again, there, here are the three within the United States, the three systems, the Bering Sea, the California Current, and the Gulf of Mexico. And one of the things we started plotting up is the, the relationship between catches of jellyfish, which in this case are in black here. So there's the Bering Sea that I showed you. And then all forage fish combined, um, so that's a number of different species from different areas, but you can see there's a very strong negative relationship. When you have very high forage fish, we don't have very many jellyfish and vice versa. So there does seem to be, in fact, it is significantly inversely related here. So look, there's the Bering Sea, the California Current, and also the Gulf of Mexico. So I mean, it's really striking how different these are. That doesn't necessarily mean it's cause and effect because it could be different environmental conditions affecting one favorably and negatively the other, but it is suspicious that they're, you know, they're so much out of sync between these two different areas. And, and we actually see it also for the, um, the Humboldt current. We've been looking at the data from that. It's not as uh, quantitative, but from what we have, it shows also this inverse relationship. Um, one of the other things we're doing, so we made some steps. We had a paper that just came out in a recent issue of MEPS where we looked at the, the distribution of forage fish, all these forage fish combined versus uh, jellyfish and kind of looking based on our surveys, where do they overlap? And the, and the ones that are shown here in red are the, sort of like the jet, the hot spots of, of, of spatial overlap. So where there's a lot of red in some years, you can see there's a pretty substantial area. You can see very much the whole Washington coast. There were a lot of overlap between jellies and fish. And, and we do this by doing um, GIS, GIS spatial maps and, and plot these out. So it, it takes a long time to come up with these maps. But, um, and we can quantify the interannual and seasonal variation in these overlaps. And then there's other years where it's relatively little overlap that the jellies found in one area and the forage fish are found in another. Or, so it's kind of a tool that we can look at to see what years might we expect the biggest impact of these jellies on forage fish. And then we're also focusing, as I mentioned, a lot in the Gulf of um, Mexico. And there the big thing is actually menhaden. That's the, pretty much their only forage fish, but it's a, it's a huge catch. It's one of the, I think, the second or third largest catch in the world in terms of uh, biomass. So it's a huge industry down there. And as you can see, it's sort of on a, on a downward trend here in the last few years. And we think that part of that might be impacted by jellyfish because they're, you know, you can see sort of the inverse relationship on an interannual basis with the, the jellyfish in green versus the, the forage fish. And again, you can see that same pattern as you saw in the Bering Sea. The jellyfish were, were really big, high in the 90s. They dropped off, and now they're back up again. So the cyclic thing is going on there as well. So again, we've been doing um, these food web models, mainly, you know, so we have anchovy, or I'm sorry, menhaden versus uh, jellyfish, which is uh, right there versus there. And again, we're calculating footprint and reach, and, and it shows the same pattern. It's pretty much as we saw in the Gulf of, uh, or California current that almost, you know, jellyfish are basically a, a trophic get, dead end. Not quite as much as it is, because there are a number of things that eat jellies in the Gulf of Mexico that we don't have, like a lot more turtles and things that we don't have. But, but it definitely 
is much more advantageous for an ecosystem to have uh, a lot of menhaden than jellyfish. And this is in a scenario similar to what I showed in terms of, so we're increasing jellyfish biomass by 50%. So that's that right there. Actually, we couldn't, couldn't get the model to work at 50%. It would crash. So we can only get up to about 43%. So basically, there's your jellyfish increasing. And look what happens to all the other components of the ecosystem, including menhaden and all the higher trophic levels. Basically, everything went down. So they're really, I mean, having a lot of jellyfish, there, there doesn't seem to be any way to have all these other components and jellyfish as well without increasing the overall production. So basically, as I mentioned, we were trying to develop some metrics that we can do, you know, some of which are simple, like what is the overall jellyfish bio, uh, biomass or the jellyfish to fish ratio or some kind of more elaborate thing, these, um, you know, reach and footprints, how those change or the ratio between those from year to year. So what we hope to do is be able to, for all these diverse ecosystems around the world, we hope to be able to look at them and see how they're structured and be able to actually provide some information to managers about what the system's doing at a particular time or what it might be doing under, you know, either overfishing scenarios or climate change scenarios. And we, we hope to be able to develop a little tool that they can plug, you know, actually have these models that they can run their own scenarios and see how they work. So we're kind of getting to that point, but we're, we've still got a ways to go. And we've actually had some interest in, uh, from several people in, in Europe and also in, the, in South Africa about trying to move our model, you know, do a similar model for their ecosystem. So hopefully we'll be able to have a, a worldwide uh, network of these models that we can look at and see how things are working. So basically, I guess, you know, it's hard to say, is this going to be what we're, you know, are we inadvertently preparing our next generation for a more gelatinous future? It's hard to say. I mean, it could be, but... Um, you know, there are, as we, as we see, they can cycle up and down and sometimes they can disappear from systems. So we really don't know whether the future is going to hold for jellyfish. But, you know, it, you know if it, the recent trends are holding, it doesn't look very favorable in terms of, you know, there, with all the other, you know, impacts that we're having in the ecosystem, jellyfish could just be another insult to the, to the ecosystem and, and certainly doesn't look like it's going to be very favorable. Now, I have to say, though, there are people that do fish for jellies and eat them. Of course, mostly Asian countries. China has a pretty substantial jellyfish fishery, and they even uh, culture jellyfish. So they have a big demand for jellyfish there, and maybe that's what we need to start doing. Is, and there actually is a fishery on the East Coast that exports jellies to um, China. So maybe that's where we'll be in the future. We'll be fishing, you know, Daniel Pauly's tr fishing down the food web. We might be someday fishing mainly on jellyfish. It's hard to say, but hope not. But anyway, with that, I just want to acknowledge some of the people that provided some of the information I showed here, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So thanks very much. Questions? George. I love jellyfish. I'm not going to fish No, no. It's give you more to work on. What drives the model? Yeah. The but model is showing here the turtles going down. I'm not, yeah, I'm not an expert on modeling. I don't do that part. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it, they do, you think they would, but I don't know if they're actually jelly limited even under low jellyfish conditions. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what would be. I think they're, yeah, I, I, that's a good point. And actually, we have done some where turtles do increase. And that, that is surprising. You're right that they do go down there. <coughs> but some other scenarios we have, the tur turtles are like the only other thing that's really right. going up. That's a good point. I don't know why that is in this particular. It depends on how the, the model runs and things like that. I don't know if in the Gulf of Mexico are they are they just do they just eat jellies there? No, they don't. The pens are surely yeah. hot. Yeah. 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 yeah, leatherbacks are. Yeah, leatherbacks are usually right. Jelly right. specialists, but yeah, yeah. yeah. they have quite a few, of course. In the, yeah. Yeah. So they may not be benefit at all by having the jellies there. Good question. Yeah. I'm thinking about the jellies being kind of passive drifters and some of your salmon being these highly mobile and moving you know, large distances. You looked at these things out of region global scales. Do you have any idea about how, what kind of a smaller spatial scales within regions, how these patterns play out? As far as their spatial overlap? Yeah. Yeah, we have. And, and it turns out that there, there is a real negative. I didn't show that, but I do have some data that indicates when, by trawl by trawl, when you get a lot of jellies, you do not get salmon. And I, I don't know whether it's sort of a, a, a active choice by the salmon to move out of those areas. I would imagine like, you know, sort of like the, um, 
you know, I guess you know, with all these tentacles out there, and Finding Nemo, if you remember that? Uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be in a giant, if I was a fish, I wouldn't want to be in a giant jellyfish patch, you know, partly because there's not a lot of room and there may not be much food there. So I'm not sure, but yeah, there is a, a definitely, and we're looking at that as part of the same project that I was showing the diet and the, or the, the feeding intensity. We see a, a negative relationship between the catches of jelly. But the problem with our trawls is that we trawl for like, you know, 20 minutes, so we're sampling over a very broad area. It's really hard to, you know, these interactions might be happening on a meter scale. And it would be great to go down and look at that. We do um, look at their, uh, we put a, like a, either a GoPro camera or have an ROV where we go down and look at their, um, the jellyfish spatial scale, but we don't see a lot of fish at those times that are hard to identify. There are some fish actually that are commensal with jellies, and we can see those because they're hanging out underneath the jelly bells. Now, I didn't talk about that, but in the Bering Sea, it's actually jellies may have a, a benefit because one of the dominant species up there, walleye pollock, and that's really how I got interested in jellies because I was studying juvenile walleye pollock. And it turns out, we didn't know this, but uh, until we sent down ROVs, the, gel, the juvenile pollock actually live inside, like uh, it was age zero, they live inside the bell or inside the tentacles of the jellyfish. And they're probably using that as shelter because there's no other shelter in the Bering Sea. There's not a lot of places for these little ju uh, juvenile pollock to hide. So it actually goes from being a negative one because the, the jellyfish feed on larval pollock, but then it may become a positive benefit to them. We don't know that, but certainly it seems like almost all the jellies we looked at had at least a few pollock in it. And some of them had a, I think the maximum had 30 pollock hanging around inside one jellyfish. So there's actually, there can be some positive benefits. You see that in the North Sea, that cod and some of the other species actually benefit. They, they juveniles live up inside the jellies possibly for shelter, or they could be picking off some of the food that the jellies collected. We think that might be another thing. But that's how I sort of accidentally got into studying jellies. It was like, wow, nobody, there's all these jellies and nobody's even looking at these things. You know, what's going on? And it turns out that you kind of get in there and George the probably tell you they're pretty fascinating and there's a lot of things they do that you can't tell by trawling them up. You know, there's just, there's lots of things that you don't know about jellies. Okay. Oh, let's see, I'll try one here first. Um, do you have a proposed mechanism for the link between jellies and the PDL? Well, uh, you know, that's related to temperature. Well, and, and temperature and also food production, the PDO tends to have, um, during the cold phase, we tend to get currents from the north, which have these big, what they call lipid-rich copepods that probably are good food, you know, for the whole food chain, but particularly for jellies and other things. So a lot of things do very well during the cold phase of the PDO. Whereas during the warm phase, we're up in our area, we're getting things from California. You know, they're not very good. So, um, <laughs> but they're uh, they're not they're not very lipid rich. You know, they're, and they tend to be smaller individuals and things like that. So, I think it's just probably tied in through the food web. But it's certainly something we want to investigate. We actually have a proposal in together to have a number of people to look at sort of the, both in California and also up in Oregon to see what other environmental relationships are related to these. You know, you sometimes need a sort of a long time series, so there aren't that many places in the world you can do it. But one of the interesting things is part of the Lentfest group, too, we're looking at all these different populations around the world, and we find out that they actually are like different populations, like in the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Mexico, that the children, they're actually very much in phase. There's a high correlation between those two, cross correlation between those two time series. So something big must be affecting them both. It can't be just a local. So something like the PDO or ENSO or something's probably, and we know at least in California current, uh, El Nino is really bad for jellies, at least in our area, I think maybe in California too, because there's just not a lot of food. And so they take a big nose dive, or at least the, the coastal jellies do. The offshore ones probably do pretty well. But now, Scott. So I kind of, I guess my question sort of follow up in a couple parts then. Mm -hmm. So one thing, uh, do you, would you know how, how long uh, does a sea nettle live? Well, that's a good question. I, I don't know. I think well a year, but we, you know, we do. We haven't had much many winter surveys, so we don't really know. I've seen them as late. The latest survey we do is November, and I've seen them there, but not very many. I think they sort of die in the fall. They, they could last over three years in captivity. In captivity. Yeah, yeah. Does very well. and, I, and I get the impression out here that we see some overwinter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like some, some portion of the population maybe overwinters. Although during the fall, late fall. You see a lot of looks like senescence mm -hmm. where they're kind of they're looking crummy and they're dying and they're lethargic and so forth and so on. But I suspect some some part of the, the population does make it through the winter. And so then the, the kind of the question is kind of like a follow up to the PDO and so forth. Is that 
how much, because you, know, you got this huge variation uh, in terms of the number of jellies in these different places. How much of that might be also a consequence of the um, how many jellies you had the year previously? Yeah. You know, and, and given the fact that you also got this benthic stage, right. where, okay, you've got these polyps down there, but mm -hmm. nothing's really happening, is it? Is it really, you think, potentially more driven by the fact that strobulation is not occurring in those years, or that the previous year was a crummy year for recruitment? Right. And that's something I, I don't have a good answer for. Okay. It could be either one of those cases. I know in the Bering Sea, we've been looking at that, and we one of the best predictors of the jellyfish abundance in a, a given year is how many were there the previous year, but because of the, you know, they tend to have cycles, so that would be a but we really don't know, you know, uh, we have seen, I, we, they have done weir surveys up in the Bering Sea and they have found, you know, like in March, some really big jellies. But you don't see those by April or May. So either they, I don't know what happens to them. But, um, I don't think they probably got last probably much more than a year. And probably much less than that because they're you know, starting off in the spring of the previous year. But that's a, that's a really good question. I don't think we know much about it at all. Yeah. Hey. cells that are found sort of north of the Columbia River and south of the Columbia River, which is where the turtles are found, mm -hmm. and they're not in the Columbia River plume now. And, and that's a very striking plume that we've ever seen, but the salinity, of course, drops down pretty low, even way out in the ocean. There's a lot of water going in there. You can, you can see the edge of the plume. It's like this line in the ocean. And, and we've actually done some toes, like inside, at the inside of the plume, right at the plume edge and outside, and we get almost all the jellies on the outside. We get very few either at the edge or inside. I don't know if it's a good question. Does the plume go all the way to the bottom end of the fresh no. lines? Or no, it's, it's about, well, it depends on where you are, but it's usually about maybe 10 meters. Okay. And it's so very it would be affecting the polyps, it would be affecting the polyps. Yeah, that's probably the case. I don't think there's any, any freshwater influence at the bottom there. At least you know, we can get a little bit offshore. It could be affecting, of course, some of the great waters mm -hmm. yeah. around off the river, but not once you get the ocean. But we don't know, you know, as, as, as we were discussing earlier, we don't know what affects polyps around. We don't even know where the polyps are. <laughs> and we, we found very few of them. It'd be a great project for any graduate students. Like, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Spent a lot of time and a lot of diving and wherever. It only took 30 years to find a box truck. Myra, do you know where, like, some of these have you ever seen in the area of polyps? We don't even know in our area. I was telling, there was a graduate student that started doing this as his master's thesis, and he finished it, but he didn't. I think they found, he probably found after years, he probably found like one or two polyps. And, and somehow he can't get a thesis out of it, but <laughs> it's not something that I'd want to do. So let me join me in, in thanking Rick for coming in.